Physics is all about matter and its behavior. What is matter? What is it made of? How does it move? How does it interact with itself? What are the fundamental forces of nature? Yeah, physics answers all of these questions. But how fast can matter go? Take this ball. We want to get it moving fast. Really fast. But I can only throw it at 2 meters per second which is not fast. How do we make it go faster? Let's be clever about this. Instead of throwing the ball while standing on the ground, let's throw it while riding a bicycle at 4 meters per second. Now, I can still throw it at only 2 meters per second and indeed, that is what I see. From my point of view, seated on a bicycle, the ball travels at only 2 meters per second. But you, standing on the ground, see it going at 6 meters per second. This is relativity. But what is the true speed of the ball? 6 meters per second or 2 meters per second? Well, it's both. Both are correct in our individual frames of reference. This is rule 1 of relativity. No observer is correct and no reference frame is the preferred or correct frame. They are all relative. Let's return to our original question. We have not thrown the object, the ball, any faster, but at least from your point of view, we've increased its speed. Consider this, we transform our ball into a particle of light, also called a photon. And a bicycle is way too slow, let's hop into a spaceship. You might know that light is the fastest thing in the universe, travelling at an eye-watering 299,792,458 meters per second. And because I don't want to say 299,792,458 meters per second all the time, let's just call it C. So if my spaceship can travel at half the speed of light, we can say it travels at C over 2 meters per second. Now, suppose I shine a torch from the spaceship. From my point of view, the light particles or photons travel at C meters per second. But from your point of view, they should travel at the speed of light plus the speed of the spaceship, which is C plus C over 2 or 1.5 C. Oh. Well, it turns out that no matter how fast the source of light may be moving, the speed of the light emitted from it is always constant. This is rule 2 of special relativity. The speed of light is constant in all frames of reference. But just think about this for a second. This completely changes, well, everything. And it is this simple fact that gives rise to all these weird phenomena like length contraction and time dilation. Why, this fact is the basis of special relativity itself. And today, we are going to see how to make sense of it. of a coordinate transformation as a magical black box that takes in your frame of reference and transforms it into another observer's frame of reference. In other words, it helps you see through a different observer's eyes. The Lorentz transformation is basically a coordinate transformation except it follows all the rules of special relativity as well. Now, in today's video, we'll be deriving the 1 plus 1 dimensional Lorentz transformation, 1 dimension for space and 1 dimension for time. So we'll take in a 2D vector x, t as an input and output another 2D vector x prime, comma t prime. Also, when we use this transformation to transform from one frame of reference to another, we don't want accelerations coming out of just nowhere. So we can be sure that the Lorentz transformation is linear. Oh, also, it depends on the velocity of the moving reference frame that we want to transform to. Now all these facts combine tells us that we can use a 2 by 2 matrix to mathematically represent the transformation. Now, all we need to do is solve for these four variables P, Q, R and S. But how? Don't we need four different equations to solve for four variables? Well, we don't have them in mathematical form right here and now. 
but with a little bit of thinking using our rules of relativity, we can derive four postulates from which we can derive the transformation. For example, here's postulate number one. From an observer's point of view, they'll always find themselves at the origin of the frame of reference. This is quite intuitive. For example, to someone on the ground, it looks like my bicycle is moving and they're stationary. And they ride in their frame of reference. But to me, it looks like they, along with the ground and everything else, are moving and I'm the one who's stationary. And I'm right in my frame of reference. We can mathematically phrase this as, when I transform to the frame of reference of an observer moving at a velocity v, their paths to space-time, also called their world line, has an x-coordinate of 0 at all values of t. Speaking of world lines, the Lorentz transformation in mathematical form is fine and all, but how do you show it in an intuitive and easy to understand way? Well, you use space-time diagrams, which are basically xy planes except the x-axis is the space axis and the y-axis is the time axis. Normally, since a lot of relativity is based on the speed of light, for example, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. The time axis is scaled down by c, which makes the world line of any photon a diagonal line with a slope of 1 or negative 1. You can represent the world lines of all objects on this diagram. For example, if my shoe was drifting through space at c over 2 meters per second, its world line would look like this. Oh yeah, I also forgot to mention, since space is represented on the x-axis instead of the y-axis, speed is run over rise instead of the conventional rise over run. Ok, back to the derivation. According to postulate 1, when I transform to the reference frame of the shoe, the x position of the shoe will be at 0 at all times t. Let's write this as an equation. We can represent the path of the shoe in our frame of reference as this vector, where v is the velocity of the shoe. Now we can Lorentz transform this to see what it looks like from the shoe's reference frame. We already know that the x coordinate of the shoe in its own frame is 0. Never mind what the t coordinate is, we'll just call it t prime. And now let's turn on auto algebra. And there you go. We have shown that Q is equal to negative PV. Let's move on to postulate 2. So now we are going to do the opposite of what we did in postulate 1. We are going to transform from the shoe's frame of reference to my frame of reference. This is basically the inverse Lorentz transformation. So we can take the inverse of this matrix and now we can multiply it with my world line in the shoe's frame of reference. But what is my world line from the shoe's frame of reference? Well, if I see the shoe as going at v meters per second in the positive x direction, the shoe sees me at going v meters per second in the negative x direction or negative v meters per second. So from the shoe's point of view, my world line can be represented by this vector here. And now we can write the equation, solve it. And we've shown that s is equal to p. Two variables down, two to go. We've already derived two variables and this is what our transformation matrix looks like now. To derive the value of r, the third postulate we will use is rule 2 of special relativity. The speed of light is constant in all frames of reference. To write this mathematically, we can say that when we Lorentz transform the world line of a photon, it will not change. This is the equation that represents the statement. And now, turn on auto algebra again.
and we've got a third variable r is equal to negative pv by c squared okay the final variable the home stretch as sal khan would say we need to solve for p but this time we're going to do it a little differently remember how i said all the way back in postulate 2 this is basically the inverse Lorentz transformation. And also, well, if I see the shoe as going at v meters per second in the positive x direction, the shoe sees me at going v meters per second in the negative x direction, or negative v meters per second. Well, if we combine these two facts together, we can establish a little equality here. Back to the shoe. From the shoe's point of view, we are moving at negative v meters per second. So if we transform from the shoe's frame of reference to my frame of reference, putting negative v as the input velocity to the transformation, we are basically doing the inverse Lorentz transformation. And mathematically, this inverse Lorentz transformation looks like this. But to find the inverse Lorentz transformation, we can also take the inverse of the transformation matrix. And that looks like this. But there can't be two different inverse Lorentz transformations, right? So logically, they must be equal. So we can equate them and let auto algebra do the rest. And P is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And our derivation is complete. P is usually called the Lorentz factor and since it is so long, we usually say that it is equal to the Greek letter gamma. Not P. Gamma. And this is what the transformations look in formal conventional notation. And thanks for watching.